Good morning, friends, and welcome. Today is April 23rd, 2023. I'm Pastor Tom coming to you from Sharon Church here in beautiful Manchester, Michigan. If this is your first time joining in one of our virtual worships, may I say thank you to you and yours for doing so. <clears throat> thank you for coming out and being part of the family in this way. If you're open to the idea of in-person worship, we do offer that each Sunday at 1030 a.m. So come on out and join the family as we gather together at 1030 to sing and to pray and to spend some time together as we look at God's word and see what it has for us today and how it speaks to our life today about um, moving forward to be holy people as God is holy. What it means to live into the um, salvation and redemption that is offered by Jesus Christ. Our scripture reading for today will be from Matthew chapter 6. So if you have your Bible handy and you want to find that, Matthew chapter 6. Today we're going to start a new sermon series entitled, Not If, But When. With that, with that said, may we spend some time together now in worship and begin with these words. Come to the Lord, all of you. There is healing and rest in the Lord. You are forgiven. Uh, you are given love and peace by God for all your days. Amen. We join me in prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit and we shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy your consolations. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so, as said, uh, we're starting a new sermon series today. Uh, not if, but when. Here we are, friends. Today we begin this new series. Over the next few weeks, we will look at one of the finest teaching sessions by Jesus found in the Gospel of Matthew. And what he had to say about when you give, when you pray, and when you fast. For this week, we'll be uh, the beginning of this journey, we will dive into Matthew 6, verses 1 through 4. So I'd like to read them to you now. Be reading from the CSB this morning. Matthew 6, 1 through 4. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father in heaven. So whenever you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be applauded by people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. But when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. This is the word of God for the people of God. And may all thanks be to God. Uh, I found this quote in the Good Reading magazine. I found it quite interesting. I want to share some of it with you. It says, some say, I've given to him the shirt off my back, and now look what he's done to me. Or I've given her the best years of my life, and look what I get in return. If we bestow a gift or a favor and expect a return for it, it is no gift but a trade. That's the point of the teaching here by Christ. He did not say to those gathered that no one should see you doing good works. To contrary, in Matthew 5, uh, Jesus states that they should let their light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify God. The point that Christ is making here to the people that gathered around to hear more of his teaching was this. What is your motive for doing the work? Why are you doing these good deeds? Who are you trying to please? What are you looking to gain or attain? The Bible is clear that we are to look at gaining and attaining the glory that comes from God, not from humanity. We aren't to been to what our society says we are to long for the gifts that god will bestow upon us not what we can get from our society remember if one was to read ahead a few verses in matthew 6 one would find these words uh, from from jesus stop collecting treasures for your own benefit on earth instead collect treasures in heaven where moth and rust 
don't eat them and where thieves don't break in and steal them. Let's get a little background on where we are this day. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 5, has begun the Sermon on the Mount, this preaching session, this teaching session that is so beautiful with the words it captures. But there's some deep teaching in there as well. He's been teaching the crowds that have gathered very a, a whole lot of things, right? He's been he has given them the beatitudes. He's taught them about being salt and light. He said that he came to fulfill the law. Then went into some deep teaching about murder and adultery, uh, divorce, taking oaths, as well as loving each other, even our enemies. Now he begins to prepare to teach the masses about three things they need to make sure that they're doing. Jesus does not say, if you remember to do these things, if you have time to do these things, <clears throat> only do these things if prompted to do them. Rather, Jesus says, when. Verse 2 of today's reading states that we should not speak of our works by the use of standing on a soapbox and using a bullhorn so that we look good in front of others. A soapbox. A soapbox is a raised platform on which one stands to make an impromptu speech. The term originates from the days when speakers would elevate themselves by standing on a wooden crate. From this elevated place, they were <clears throat> more easily seen by the crowd, thus making it easier to spew forth the words that they would like to share with the others. The term is also used metaphorically to describe a person engaging in often flamboyant, impromptu, or unofficial public speaking, such as one that wanted to let the crowd know that they did this great thing. And that's what Jesus was getting at. Many people would stand and shout and holler about the great things that they were doing, looking to influence or gain approval from others. Matthew Kratz shares this story about an Eastern aesthetic holy man who covered himself with ashes as a sign of humility and regularly sat on a prominent street corner of his city. When tourists asked to take his picture, the mystic would rearrange the, the ashes to give the best image of destitution and humility. A great deal of religion amounts to nothing more than rearranging religious ashes to impress the world with one's supposed humility and devotion. The problem, of course, is that the humility is a sham and the devotion is to self not to God. Such religion is nothing more than a game of pretense, a game at which the scribes and Pharisees of Jesus' day were masters. Matthew Kratz would finish by saying that because their religion was mostly an act and a mockery of God's true revealed way for his people, Jesus' most blistering denunciations, well, they were reserved for them, those that would make a mockery of God. May I say to you, friends, too many people today think they need to do works and then expect to get something for the work that they've done. The real issue for the people of Jesus' time, the people of John Wesley's time, and even still the people of our time today is this. We're too caught up in trying to parade our piety, trying to get our 15 minutes of fame. Oh, we want to look religious. We want others to see our good works. And at that point, we fall into the trap of going through the motions and looking like a Christian, but not really following Christ. Sure, we may go to church because it's something that our families have always done, but this can lead to not truly being concerned with others and their salvation because we're too caught up in trying to work ourselves into salvation, which just so happens to not be in the Bible. Rather, the Word of God states very clearly that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. That means that you cannot, you will not, and you shall not ever be able to buy, work, or earn your way into heaven. We are all born with a fallen sin nature, which only God 
has a plan to fix. <clears throat> you could do all the mission work that you can get your hands on, but if you do not receive and believe in Jesus as Savior, the one that died that you may live, then heaven you will not see. There are some that would say living a life of piety is so much takes so much time. Um, uh, that living a life of piety is is how much time one spends on their knees in prayer, or that their salvation comes from being part of the founding family of a local church. Still, others think that their ticket to salvation comes by simply doing or saying certain things, or being in line with the culture and society of the day. We just can't upset the apple cart. What well, may I say to you, friends? These are exactly the things that Jesus came to abolish and teach against, stating that he is, in fact, the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father but by him. So go ahead, stand on your box, and continue to share with the world all the good things that you are doing. But be informed of this. One day, Jesus is coming back. One day we will each stand before the king and he will reward those that served him and blessed others with the same grace given to them that the kingdom of God may grow. Social justice is the phrase right now. Helping others, loving others, doing for others. This is all good and needs to continue to happen. But what is the motive behind it? Why is it being done? Who are we doing all of this work for? If the answer to any of these questions is anything other than God, then the work is being done for the wrong reason. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement that would go on to become the United Methodist Church, was a grand supporter of not just helping others, giving to them, doing for them, helping them to succeed in society. But he helped for the right reasons as well. Early in his life, he seemed to think that all the good works were what he needed to make it to heaven, so work he did. Yet in much grief and heartache, it was upon going to a Bible meeting, going to a society meeting, uh, one night that the Lord spoke to John in a very special and meaningful way. Now, Adam Hamilton, in his book entitled Revival, shares these words. This man, who was trying so hard to prove himself to God, or to himself, discovered that God offered freely what Wesley had worked so hard to attain. This is how he described the experience in his journal. In the evening, I went very unwillingly to to a society in Aldersgate Street. There, one was reading Luther's preface to the Epistle of the Romans. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. It was at this point that there was a real passion and desire out of true love and devotion to his fellow person, Wesley truly understood that it was because of Christ and our faith in him, not our works, because God has already done the work. It is this that sets people free. You can give and give and give, but if you do not give the one thing that truly matters, your self to Christ, all the other things, all the other giving, that's futile. There was a man named Bob, and Bob attended the same church for many years. Bob was asked to be part of many different committees at many different times, but he always turned them down. One day, Bob passed away, and the church went on as usual. It was the very next week that the pastor noticed that the light in the entryway was out. He had been there many years and never remembered that light going out. The next week, one of the ladies noticed that the clock in the fellowship hall wasn't working correctly. 
In her 47 years of attending the church, she never knew of the clock battery ever dying. It was not until the next week that when one of the trustees noticed that there was more garbage in the yard than normal, and mentioned it, that the people of the church began to realize how much Bob did around the church, and with no recognition. That, I believe, is how Jesus wants us to work for the kingdom as well, without having to be noticed or mentioned. May we continue to lift up and give thanks for all that do good for the kingdom and keep working ourselves. May we also remember that we do not do so for the earthly recognition. Rather, we do because Christ has done. May we be more willing to give ourselves for others as Christ has given himself. May we strive to be good and faithful servants who will one day be rewarded with his faithfulness and generosity. Listen to this quote that I found from Modern Maturity. The world is full of two kinds of people, the givers and the takers. The takers eat well, but the givers sleep well. This leads us to the next part of giving. We can give and give and give. We can give to the needy, to the poor, to the less fortunate. But may we also remember to give back to God ourself. That's right, in case you missed it or haven't been following along, the Lord God wants you. He longs for you to give yourself to him. The Lord desires nothing more than for you to be like Abraham, to be like Moses. God longs for you to be like Daniel and David, to be like Joshua, uh, and give yourself to the Lord. Listen again to what Joshua says to the people of Israel in Joshua 24. Fear, now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. He would go on to say that if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. And finally, Joshua would give them this doozy. Are you ready? You know it, don't you? Excuse me. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Praise God. May we all be like Joshua. Friends, that is my prayer for each of you. That you will be as bold as Joshua and shout out loud that you give yourself and your household to the Lord God and serve him out of faithful obedience. Just as Joshua's words challenged the people of his time, the people of Jesus' time, the people of Wesley's time, and, and hopefully it challenges us today. As we are gathered as one body through virtual, through this virtual space, I challenge each of us, myself included, to choose this day who we will serve. Will we be like the church that the world seems to see, the one that is only out for self-gain and self-preservation, the one that flops around like a fish out of water seeking sustainability from all the wrong places? Or will we rally together with Jesus and be the church that he longs for us to be? Loving and caring, giving and helping, because of the redemption and salvation, the new life offered by God. Friends, the lesson today is this. We need to not just read the stories of how Jesus gave. We need to not just read the stories of how the early church gave, of how John gave, or even how Bob gave. We need to be like Bob and be like John and be like the early church. We need to strive to encourage one another with hope and love that we too can be like Jesus and give, not because we have to, but out of love. May we start to give because of the fire that burns in our hearts as well. We give because God first gave. One final quote from a dear friend of mine. 
My only assignment is to use whatever time, talents, and treasures he has given me in a way that blesses others and gives glory to God. And to that, I say amen. Let us pray. We confess that we far too often want proof of everything, O Lord. We want proof that someone loves us. We want proof that we can trust others. We want proof that everything in life is going to turn out all right. Lord, we give you thanks for this teaching of Jesus. Teaching us that it's not about just giving. It's not just about the giving. But it's about giving for the right reasons. It's definitely not about standing on the box and shouting through the bullhorn, look what I've done but it's about giving out of love. That we can, that it all points back to you. That you are the one who receives all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. It's not for ourselves that we do the work that we do. We do it for you. That we might be salt and light that guides and directs others toward you, that they may find you as well, that they may find the new life that is offered to them by you through Christ. Lord, we give you thanks for your spirit that is with us, that sustains us, that encourages us, that lifts us up and and, and redirects us and, and shows us the way of life that we are to live. May we go into this week inspired by you, O Lord, to show and share, to give to our community, not out of obligation, but out of love. Out of love not only to our community, but out of love to you that they may see you in the works we do. We pray it all in the name of Jesus and ask God as we prepare to go, um, as we lift before you those names and situations that weigh heavy upon our heart, we bring them before you and say, God, here it is. We ask for your healing and comfort in all the situations. Bring healing. Bring comfort, bring peace and joy. That even at this moment there may be someone who could testify to your presence with them. Oh, Lord, that we would all be able to testify to your presence. And say, God is doing a new thing. We pray it all in the name of Christ. Amen. Friends, as we prepare to go into the week to come, God has given you rest and peace. And he will go with you as you leave this place. Feel the healing love of God in your life. Bring the good news of Jesus, uh, bring the, the good news of God's love to all who you meet. Go in peace. And until next week, be a blessing. Amen.